There we go. All right, so I'm gonna talk about talent management. Every time that a leader comes to the Army Cyber Institute, one of the biggest questions they have, one of their biggest problems is talent management. Unfortunately, not everyone really has the same definition of talent management. So that's really what I'm gonna talk about. What is cyber talent management? A lot of times, it seems like this is the magic formula for talent management. Bring in the best people, ideally by throwing lots of money at them, throw more money at them to keep them, and that is somehow mission success. Anyone really think that's the magic formula? Anyone? Nope. Uh, if anything, that, come on, click. Reminds me of this. It's a slightly more comprehensive plan than the underpants gnomes, but not by a whole lot. So what does talent management actually look like? Keep in mind, this is just my interpretation and try to just let it wash over you, okay? I don't expect you to be able to read this, um, but the point is, it, there, there's a lot. There are a lot of factors that go into who enters the military service or civilian service or comes into any job whatsoever. What brings them in, what keeps them in, what entices them to stay, what drives them out. Lots of things, and we have to account for all of them, or at least a good number of them, if we are in fact actually going to do anything resembling effective talent management. And yeah, that is kind of complicated. Um, but why do we even care in the first place? Um, what is the point of talent management? And okay, so I keep using this word. Who has actually defined this word, this phrase, talent management? So let, let's back up a little bit. So we've got a couple of definitions up there. Um, we do have the obligatory Gartner definition, uh, which you know, talks about some stuff and you know, talks about HR processes because human resources is absolutely part of talent management. If we're not including them, then we're probably failing. Uh, we also have an army definition. I'm army, so that tends to be the definitions I'm gonna use. And it includes a lot of that same stuff, but also includes our favorite military buzzword ever, readiness. Um, and you know that's gonna come up later, so I'm not gonna belabor that point here. Um, but so that brought up a bunch of areas that we can talk about. And there are even more on that crazy spider chart that I threw up earlier. So let's dive a little bit deeper into some of those. So I'm a person who likes to start at the end. What is the point of me doing this anyway? Why are we doing talent management? And as Chris said, it, you know, as a military, our job is to fight and win the nation's wars. That is our entire purpose for being here. And so I have to support that aim by providing, you know, we have this whole ends, ways, and means thing. So the end is that fighting and winning the nation wars. You know, we have ways, the stuff that we do to do it, and then means resources, which people are a resource. So it's essentially resource management is what we're talking about here. Okay, good job, Sergeant Major, you regurgitated doctrine. Um, what actually is the problem here? Well, there's two problems when it comes to mission accomplishment. And the first and the really sticky one, and another one that Chris mentioned earlier, is that a lot of our senior leaders don't even know what the heck we do in the first place. And that's a problem. And so they can't even begin to understand how to use us, how to manage us. So as an example, um, particularly familiar for my army brethren, but you know, hopefully the concept translates fairly well. If you're doing a large scale training exercise at the National Training Center 
and your supply train just falls to pieces, gets wrecked, collapses, you suddenly have no water, you're having no fuel, you're having a bad day. The people running the exercise have the ability to, okay, pause, reset, going to get you back on target so you can get back to the job of blowing stuff up because that's what we really all joined the military to do, right? Which is great for exercising the blowing stuff up thing, but if we're really honest, blowing stuff up is what the military is good at. We probably don't need as much exercise on that as we do in not letting our supply train collapse in the first place. But by hand waving it, by resetting it, we never actually practice fighting through a collapsed supply chain so that we never really get that visceral understanding of this is why I need to protect my supply. This is why I cannot outrun my logistics train. We never do that. And we have the same problem with a lot of our cyber capabilities as well. We don't have currently, we're working on it. We actually have several projects at the Army Cyber Institute. We'd love to talk about it. Um, plug, plug, uh, where it's difficult to accurately simulate a lot of the things that we would like to do, not just from a cyberspace operation side, but from that electromagnetic spectrum operations, that electromagnetic warfare sort of stuff. And so if we can't simulate that, then our commanders, those maneuver leaders, the ones really calling the shots who become combatant commanders someday, those are the people we work for, they don't understand what I do. And so they can't use me. And so I'm going to end up being in a dead end job, not doing the job I joined the military for, which is frustrating. And so I'm probably gonna up and quit if that's the environment that I'm in. If I'm not in one of those explicitly cyber units, life can kind of suck. So we have to train our leaders on how to understand what we do. And there's another problem here is, you know, how do we measure our ability to accomplish these missions in the first place? Which brings us back to readiness. And readiness sounds simple, but it's really a thorny problem because what we're trying to do is trying to take a very qualitative thing. How can you accomplish a mission? Do you have the capability to do this in this environment with the people you have? And how much of that can you do? So do you have the capability and do you have the capacity? Which the military has been doing this for a while, but anytime you try to reduce that to a quantitative problem, essentially by asking a bunch of yes or no questions, you end up losing a lot of the fidelity. You don't really understand what is going on. So readiness is inherently problematic because you get what you measure. And more precisely, you get exactly what you measure. Anytime there is a box that I can turn green, I will figure out exactly how to turn that box green so I don't get yelled at. So this is a problem if we don't accept a little bit of failure from our subordinate commanders. Um, it, it's a cultural thing. And then the Cyber Mission Force and all of its infinite wisdom took an already problematic system and then layered on these things called work roles and proficiency levels, things that don't really exist elsewhere in the military. You know, normally when, you know, at least the army's looking at readiness, a lot of times it's, do you have a person of the right military specialty? Are they the right pay grade? Have they done you know, some essential training related to that job? Have they qualified on their weapons sometime in the last couple of years? Cool, they're qualified to do this mission. We have not only that military specialty pay grade, um, normal army stuff that we have people doing like weapons qual and fitness tests, well, which kind of got put on hold because pandemic and we designed a new one and that's going great. Um, but then we also have within this one military specialty, there are approximately 24 different things that I could possibly be doing. And the training for them is not remotely related to each other. And within each of those 24 different things, I could be a basic senior master level regardless of what my pay grade is. 
also regardless of whether I'm enlisted, warrant officer, officer, or civilian. So we just made an already weird system even harder. Good job us. And then on top of that, in theory, each team is supposed to be able to do the same things, which is great, except each command uses their teams a little bit differently so they get better at different missions. But they still have to maintain a baseline of proficiency in what they're supposed to be able to do. So how do you do that? Largely with some formal learning. And this is how we get people up to speed in the first place. And so where do the standards come from? Well, Cybercom came up with a lot of different standards for individual training, JCT and CS, team training, um, TNEO worksheets and the TNR manual. And yes, it's alphabet soup, don't worry about it. Um, so we have a ton of standards, but they don't entirely nest under each other very well. Um, that's something they're working on. Um, but that makes things a lot harder. And then we also have to worry about, you know, to what level do we get people proficient in this? There's three major categories of stuff that we tend to call training, but words matter. Um, words are important. And so it's really important that we use them correctly. So first up, we have awareness. It's essentially enough knowledge about a subject in order to change your behavior relating to that subject. And so that is what I need my maneuver commanders to have. They need awareness of what I do, how to use me in order to support their operations. They need to be aware of the consequences of their actions if they ignore me and the capabilities that I bring to the fight. Because whether they admit it or not, they are conducting warfare in an environment that includes cyberspace concerns. And so if they ignore me, that means they automatically lose part of that fight. So we have to work on the awareness piece. There's also training. There's, you know, again, Chris has set up a lot of points for me to tee off of. Um, there are tools that, you know, roughly speaking, any monkey can run. You know, click button, run scan. Cool, I can train you to do that. A couple of problems with training are that it is very fragile. At any update of that capability, I need to retrain my entire workforce. That is suboptimal. And the other thing is that if I'm dealing with technological stuff and I am training a person to do a series of mechanical tasks, well, I can replace that person with a very small shell script. But in order to do that, I have to have not just the training to do that job, but the education on how to run a shell script. So education is really that third piece and where I would love if a lot of our learning, the executive agents for advanced cyber training thing that General Kraft was talking about earlier, if that was really truly education because that's what teaches you what's going on under the hood. It's much less fragile. Every time there's a change, you can adapt. And when it breaks, you can also fix it and it's awesome, but it means you spend a lot of time up front. And depending on who you ask, that time is extremely valuable, whereas training is really quick. So it takes far less time. An illustrative example, uh, I was doing a training with industry assignment and I was able to work in a SOC for a company that you have most definitely heard of. And one of the things that they told me as I was starting my little internship there was, you know, we don't have different tiers of socks. We don't have like a tier one who are the people who just sit there monitoring the dashboard and then they call us when something breaks to a tier two and then they escalate to a tier three. No, everyone does everything. That tier one stuff is a script. Why would I have a person sitting there when I can automate, hey, if you see this alert, give me a phone call. That's a totally scriptable process. What they did was they spent a good six months up front for any new hire, getting them up to speed to be self-sufficient analysts so that everyone was far more capable. And yes, what if I train them and I leave, but what if I don't train them and they stay? And yes, I just used the word training wrongly there. Guilty of it myself. But the point being, 
as people who are far better educated up front, they're much more capable. And even when they left and moved on to other companies, that meant they had someone who was an in at that new company. So instant networking. And that also meant that when anyone asked where they learned those skills, they could say, yeah, I got them over there. They did me a solid by making sure I knew what I was doing. And that right there is a recruiting tool. So yes, I'm gonna be rotating people out, but the stories they tell when they leave matter as I'm trying to pull new people in. So retention, not everyone is going to stay, but I want the right people to stay. But what even are the right people? What does it mean to be the best? A lot of times we, especially on initial accessions, tend to focus on things like who has already gotten a college degree in the field, who has already been working in this field, who's been working in a related field, a little bit older. And those things are great for initial accessions. And there's some really interesting data on this. The people who have a lot of those credentials, who enlist already having a college degree or having worked in the field, tend to have a much easier time getting through their initial enlistment. They get through that initial contract with fewer issues. Awesome. But, there's always a but, when they hit that first opportunity to re-enlist, they're much less likely to re-enlist than the people who did not already have those credentials who have made it that far. So what does it mean to be the best? Does it mean that you started here and I started down here and we eventually both get to here? You know, so is it about your ability to learn, your growth potential, your propensity to continue serving? The best has a lot of potential um, definitions and we don't really know what that is. And on top of that, we have also, you know, in the past couple of years, made some changes to how military retirements work, which also means that calculus for should I stay or should I go has changed a heck of a lot. And another really interesting point here, we often use retention as an indicator of command climate. Again, it's really hard to quantify stuff that is fuzzy, like how much do people like their jobs? But one of the ways that we used to do that is how many people choose to stay in that job when they have the opportunity to leave. The interesting thing about this is that because of how we have set up the cyber mission force, I have my adcon channels who's responsible for man training and equipping my units. And then I have the opcon channels, the people who actually use it. And yes, this is not a new concept, but that opcon digs down a lot lower in the cyber forces than it does in a maneuver force. You know, out in maneuver land in the army, a brigade combat team, a unit commanded by an 06 is probably gonna be the smallest slice of organization that you're gonna get. That means you have a brigade commander, com a battalion commander, a company commander that are between me and that opcon channel. Like they're all the same. Like they both have opcon and adcon. Whereas in the cyber mission force, I have a team, depending on service and type of team, you know, might be 03, 04, or 05. And that is the lowest level that has both opcon and adcon. A company commander does not have opcon of their own troops. This is a little weird. And that means that that opcon, that unit that the team works for, whether it's JFHQC, CNMF, some other organization, have a lot of influence over that team's command climate. And so it's really easy to look at, oh, this team belongs to this company battalion brigade. If there's poor retention, it's their fault. And it might be, they, they might not be doing a great job, but don't discount that opcon channel. The people that they work for on a day-to-day -day basis have just as much impact over the desire of those people to stay in the military as the ones who are responsible for their care and feeding. So motivation, again, both the opcon and adcon matter. And I can see who finally read the poster.
And one of the really cool things about the military is that we get a sense of purpose that is nearly unrivaled. We are able to do things that no one else can legally do. And that's a huge selling point. And once again, there's a but, it comes with a lot of bureaucracy. There's not just the general things that come along with being in the military, like you know, actually having to keep up on weapons qualification and fitness tests and all those stuff. But there's also things like barracks and dealing with DPW and you know, military facilities can not always be some of the best workplaces and things like having to move constantly. Like I am super excited that I am not gonna move this summer because I moved the last three summers. Like this gets old. And like, have you tried finding a place to live lately? Even if you're renting, it, it's vicious out there. And so those are a lot of stressors that not everyone else has. And so, you know, that's some burden that we're putting on our service members that can make it seem like it's not really a great idea to stay in. And balancing all of that in your family makes projecting a career hard. And as General Kraft said, you know, the Army Cyber Branch is all of seven and a half years old. That means people like me, like who are at the top of the game, weren't cyber always. We all came from somewhere else. And so we don't really know what it means to have a full career within the cyber branch yet. It's not a whole lot of consensus. You ask one person and they have one plan for the branch and you ask another person and they have another plan for the branch and we haven't quite converged them yet. And so how do you plan five, 10, 15, 20 years out? It's really hard. And, you know, we have this offense thing, this defense thing. And you know, so what even like, is it sheer dumb luck of what unit I land in first and that determines the trajectory of my career? Or do I really have an opportunity to bounce back and forth? Do I get depth? Do I get breadth? We don't know what the right answer is yet. We don't know the direction that the force will take. And I expect the pendulum will swing a couple of times but in the meantime, it's a lot more uncertainty, which brings us to personnel. Anytime I'm talking about people, I have to have slots to put them in the first place. I have that HR system that says how you get promoted. What positions are you supposed to have in order to be considered KD complete, to have those key developmental jobs that you need to get promoted? Weirdly, I have had none of those jobs and they keep promoting me anyway doesn't work so great for the officers. Yay, NCO Corps. And again, it's an immature branch. And like, it can be cool getting in on the ground floor. Like I magically became a 17 series Army Cyber as soon as that was a possibility. So like, I got to be on the ground floor and build everything. That meant I had to build everything. And that's a lot, that's, not quite what I was hoping for. And so if the one Space Force person that supposedly registered has shown up, like this is a cautionary tale. Like if you don't have a plan for what these people are gonna do to be effective and do meaningful work from day one, it's gonna be frustrating. And they're gonna tell their buddies how frustrating it was. And they're gonna be like, yeah, maybe I'm not gonna do that. L let me talk to you in five years. So, so what do we do? Um, at the small unit, leadership matters. Everyone who interacts with everyone is a small unit leader as far as I'm concerned. You have the ability to influence the perceptions of the people around you. Take that responsibility seriously. You have a very direct impact over the quality of life of everyone on your teams. For those larger leaders, look at the systemic issues. Look at where there's an entire team who magically has pay issues. Look at, you know, are there consistent issues with work orders and leaky ceilings in the barracks and things like that? What is making life difficult for your people as a whole? And go after those issues. 
And sometimes you have to raise it up to a higher level. You need those senior most leaders who can cut through that red tape, who have the magic budgetary power to actually say, no, this is what's important and make it happen and stand on the desks of the people at DPW and say, I am not leaving your office until someone's at my soldier's barracks and they're not living in moldy conditions anymore. It takes a senior leader sometimes to do that. So to wrap up, yes, it's complicated. There's a lot here and I complained about a whole bunch of stuff and I came up with very few answers and I'm sorry for that. Um, but the cool thing is that there's a lot of different levers that you can pull. It is not just about money. Like, yes, money helps to a point, but it's not the only thing. Like if you have an engaging work environment, people just might be willing to take a pay cut to work for you. So figure that out. And this is a team sport. Whatever you have learned, whatever works for you, whatever little life hack works in your unit, share it so that we can spread that across the entire force. Again, this is about all of us working together, even though Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Space Force, um, good luck. Um, we all have different personnel systems. We have different specialties. We have all this different stuff the essential things that we're trying to do are the same. We want good people who can do the job and want to be here. We have the same purpose. Um, so, not sure if I have a couple minutes for any questions. All right. Can't see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So question is, you know, the JQR process, the job qualification record, how you get qualified in a work role in the first place. Um, it definitely has been important, especially for nudging people towards the more senior levels of that proficiency. Um, and one thing that the Army has done is tying a lot of that to special pays as well. Okay, yes, it's not just about money, but people will do some things for money. And if you tie things like mentorship to the JQR process, to special pays, suddenly people become a lot more interested in developing their teams and providing that mentorship when that's a requirement of them. Craziness. And yes, it can very much become a, how do I write the JQR so that it becomes easy to achieve exercise? Um, but hopefully as, again, the executive agency thing becomes a little bit more solid and the JQRs become less fluid, hopefully that will even out and yeah. So long-term, hopefully yes. Immediate term, yeah, we, it's, yeah. Um, so that's all the time I have. Yeah.